Welcome to uh, welcome to our September eighth Board of Health meeting. Um, so I guess I'll start out by reading our little preamble here. Uh, chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, known as an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations, was passed by the General Court and signed into law by Acting Governor Karen Polito on July 16, 2022. That legislative action revised Section 20 of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and in so doing provided modifications to Massachusetts Open Meeting Law, which allow for flexibility to hold remote only and hybrid meetings while preserving public access and when appropriate public participation. Currently that additional flexibility will expire on March 31, 2025, unless additional legislative action occurs. As part of today's hybrid meeting, all votes will occur via roll call. All right, so uh, welcome. I think we're gonna start with uh, any public comments that we may have at the moment. We do roll call first. Okay. So then let's do roll call first. Um, uh, all right. So uh, Kathleen? Here. Rob? Here. Ed? Here. Stephen? Here. Tato? Here. <laughs> all right. Now any public comments? I didn't have any deliver to us besides the ones that you guys got about uh, 1688, the email. Other than that, I've had no one request to speak. I do think we have a couple people. Do we have anyone? Yeah. Are either of you guys here for cut for public comment? I am. Doug? Yeah. Okay. Do I approach? Yeah, 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 come on. Yeah. So introduce yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, here's yeah. a chair right here. I know I'm kind of off sparks by the way. Hi, I'm Doug Fox. I'm a need a resident. <clears throat> I know some of you know me and some don't, so it's fine. Um, I wanted to, uh, am I looking at the owl? Um, who, uh, I wanted to ask that the board consider putting um, uh, regulations in place that would allow outside dining to allow dogs. Now, just so you know, right now, there are restaurants that look the other way. Any night you go, you might see a couple there. You might see them on sitting on people's laps and stuff. Um, but there are towns that have allowed it, um, but with strict regulations around it, like they can't be on the can't be on chairs, can't be on tables. Uh, the uh, staff aren't allowed to touch the dogs. You have to have um, everyone on a leash. Um, now, why would you want to consider this with all the other things that you're dealing with? Um, I think it'd be awesome for people with dogs because we do not have a dog park anywhere close to downtown. And during the summers, you have all these people walking through town with their dogs and no place to really go. Uh, it would be good for restaurants because restaurants are hurting in the summer because half our town has second homes and heads off other places. So it enable them to have a dog night on their least busy night of the week and yet give something for community. Um, there's a bunch of them in Newton. Newton's always been very lenient with this. Um, if you go to one of them, there are tons of people, tons of dogs raising money for charity. Um, I think we just never really had any outside dining. So I don't know if that's why we never really looked at this, but if you look at Newton's regulations or Boston did it for this summer, um, Establishments have to apply, they have to show what area is gonna be dog friendly area and they have to agree to some rules for them and for um, patrons, so. And currently what's our regulation with any, did we specifically so, say no dogs? Or? Only service dogs only service. currently. Yeah, and that's like, I mean, you know, so many people that have service yeah. dogs that aren't service dogs and there's dogs, and once again, this. They look the other way, but like I, I spoke to uh, restaurants that were interested in doing like a dog night and they can't right now. Um, and they're not interested in fighting the fight, but I just thought if I came here, I feel like we just haven't really looked at it, that it could have some benefits for restaurants and for residents. And a lot of residents right, in this town right, are dogs. So look, look at the, um, you know, talking to the public health officials there and just seeing what the history has been, you know, yeah. since they have that advice. Mm -hmm. In Boston, I mean, you know, surrounding, you know, our surrounding communities locally mm -hmm. and see what their experiences are. Sure. Yeah. 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 Obviously, we want to make sure there haven't been any problems, you know, dogs fighting, you know, their patrons. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. And I have no idea. I just know I just, my tent is a patron and 
they're definitely good experiences. And I see our place is kind of dead, you know, like Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays in the summer and even Fridays. But like, I don't think they would do it on those nights, but it would um, give people some place to go. So. We can definitely look into it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's move on to review of the minutes. Any notes to the minutes for anyone? Ten. Okay. Um, we will accept the minutes of the July 14th, 2023 meeting. Second. Okay. Uh, so in favor, Kathleen? Yes. Ed? Yes. Steven? Yes. Rob? Yes. Tato? Yes. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, legal discussion of Board of Health Powers. And I think we have uh, Cheryl and Christopher here. Cheryl went to the wrong building, so she's on her way. Oh. <laughs> um, so she'll be here in a hot minute. But uh, Chris is here. The wrong <laughs> Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you? Hello, everybody. Hello. <clears throat> All right, so Chris, are you going to kick us off? Or? Sure, uh, just a very brief uh, discussion from me, and I think this comes um, largely in response to uh, correspondence that the board has received recently and uh, over time, um, urging it to um, compel some environmental testing of property at 1688 Central Avenue, where there's a proposed uh, child care facility, um, term, which had been in permitting for the planning board, it had been subject to previous discussion uh, with the Board of Health. Um, and is currently in, in litigation. Um, but I know that the board has received correspondence recently uh, urging it to take some action relative to the property. Um, and we've heard these concerns before. Uh, we've looked into it previously uh, and again in response to the latest round of um, uh, correspondence. And uh, you know, when, when we look into it, I just wanted to share with the board that I, I, I have not been able to identify a clear basis for uh, in regulation or statute um, for the board to um, be taking any particular action here to order or require uh, environmental testing of the property. Um, again, we looked into it um, and it's having a real clear basis for the board to be uh, taking action here. Um, and in my experience, um, the types of concerns that are being expressed uh, relative to the property are, in my experience, ones that would be handled, if at all, under 2180. Um, by by the state, uh, with, with the lead in the enforcement response being taken by the state. Um, so, based on my review, um, just wanted to share that I would suggest, uh, based on my review, uh, that there be no particular action taken now by the Board of Health in response to these latest requests. Um, again, based on my review of, of, of the, the property, uh, what we know about it, um, and sort of the, the body of um, law. That, that we have to apply here. So that's that's most of what I had for the board, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Welcome. Hi, everybody. This is Cheryl Savara. Hi. I went to the wrong building. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question. Go ahead. Um, my, question, my question is didn't we do something about having them have to have a site professional? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, when, so when this was before the planning board for a special permit, uh, application, I want to say about a year and a half, maybe close to two years ago. Um, there was, I'm not, I think, a number of meetings where the board uh, considered this and uh, urged the planning board to include a condition in its permit um, that required the applicant to fund a licensed site professional uh, for the property to be hired by the town. So it was a town consultant at the applicant's expense. Uh, that condition, um, when it was included in the permit, to my memory, was one that the applicant was willing to agree to. Um, so that was something that was, I think, both a product of the board's, this board's input, but also the result of some um, discussion with the applicant. Uh, when the applicant, however, uh, elected to appeal the planning board's permit, that condition was effectively lost during the litigation. Um, that is one that was... Um, the whole planning board permit as a result of the, the recent ruling out of the land court. And I can answer questions about that if the court has them. Uh, but if the whole permit uh, effectively has, has um, been overturned by the land court. But in particular, that condition that was included at the board, this board's urging 
uh, is one that was going to come out of the permit even before the land court ultimately ruled as part of the, the um, pre-trial preparation. It's my understanding. I was not trial counsel to the planning board, but it's my understanding that that condition, it was agreed it was going to come out of the permit even before uh, the trial began. What was the, you know, the logic behind that agreement? I, I was not advising the planning board during the litigation process. I, I, I think it is, but my suspicion is, and again, I, I was not trial counsel, is that's one that um, the board was worried would not ultimately would not survive the trial. So it was, a, it was dropped in an effort to sort of pare down the issues that were going to be actively litigated during the trial of the case. I saw that there's an executive session for the select board and the planning board over this matter coming up next week. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know how you do an executive session in the middle of the meeting law. Um, so that, that's kind of another issue. Um, but I guess I'm wondering why the, you know, why the change of heart it looked like this project was, you know, set to go, or everything was going, do we have any idea why there was a change of heart from the developer? In terms of what? Oh, so they feel, you know, they, they said that we're pretty happy with what the planning board does. Let's, let's move forward. And now, wait a minute, we're appealing the planning board's decision. I, I can't speak to the okay. applicant's um, okay. decision making on that. Sure. I guess my, my biggest concern is, you know, we, yeah. we've been shown at least photographs, you know, you have to verify what they are, of what looks like, you know, potential toxic waste on, on the property. Um, I don't want it to look like, you know, this board has looked the other way. And then we wind up having harmed kids, you know, 20 years from now. And we could have done something we did. You know, now, if we truly don't have jurisdiction, and, you know, our move is to, you know, send a letter to the Mass Department of, you know, Environmental Protection and say, look, you know, we've got a possible sensitive use area here. We also are concerned because we're rather close to Walker Pond there. I don't know if we have the, you know, how far we are away that that's an issue in terms of that environmental issue. Um, you might want to look into it if that's the appropriate course that we need to take, so be it. Um, but I don't want it to come out that, you know, we knew about something, we didn't do anything about something, and now we have a problem. You know, I think that's my biggest concern. And is there precedent for that for sending a letter to DEP or some other? <laughs> that could certainly happen. Yeah. Um, Cheryl, I know you've joined this as well. Is there anything that you wanted to add, especially around kind of Board of Health uh, jurisdiction? Well, I, I would just say, and again, I don't represent Needham. Um, you have counsel that represent, I can only provide legal education and technical assistance. But I, I have spoken with um, your health director on this, who is probably one of the most experienced health directors in the United States, um, or I, I would say. I've worked with him for decades. Um, and and his, his feeling, and my feeling as well, is First of all, you have just you have you can act in your discretionary function. What you decide is is what you decide, and you have the legal authority to make decisions. My understanding, though, and, and when we talk about boards of health and what their role is, I mean, our our job is compliance. It's not punishment. It's compliance. And my understanding in this case is that the mitigation, if there were to be any environmental situation here that would need to be addressed would be to add the six to 12 inches of soil cover, which is what the developer from my understanding is has, has, has been willing to do. So I'm not sure if we're about compliance and that's gonna happen, I'm not sure. And again, it's your decision you would have the legal authority to make whatever decision you make, but I'm not sure what else would, what else you could do um, in, in this case from what, from what I've read. That would be my only um, statement really. I and mean, again, it's up to, you know, you get advice from your legal counsel. So would we be within our rights to reinstate the requirement for a license of professional? Or is that pushing it? Well, I, I think it, it it probably is pushing it a little bit because it's already 
you know, you've got a court decision now um, and they've utilized the, the Dover Amendment. So you've got, you know, you've got a court decision relative to that. And, and I think, you know, you've done your due diligence is from what I can read. And I wasn't intimately involved in this and I know it's been going on for years, but with the Dover Amendment, with what you've already done and with the court decision, um, again, you can act within your discretionary function. You know, your decision is your decision. But, um, you know, I, I would leave that up to your attorney. I'm not going to opine on whether, um, I, I would just suggest that there is a legal decision um, that saw Dover Amendment issues with, with this case. Okay. I was just going to say, I mean, the reason that MCP, this 21E was set up was, was to deal with these kinds of sites. So you would have this kind of issue all over the state, right? I mean, it's the only use we know of really is auto, somebody working on cars, right? I mean, that has occurred all over the town. Um, and I think if we get involved in every site, it, it just sets a precedent for, you know, these are minor risks. He's already addressing it by it sounds like adding clean fill on top, which is what you would do anyway. I don't see what process would be any different. Um, I didn't, way back when we had this first meeting, I had no interest in getting involved in this because then I could see that every time there's a site being developed or somehow the environmental review, we also were never authorized testing. We authorized looking for an LSP to maybe look over the site's LSP their work, but we couldn't find anybody to bid on the work. So I think it's a logical ending point for this project, mm -hmm. in my view. Now, is there anything that prevents the developer from having another change of heart and not putting in the bill? And if they don't put in the bill, what do we do? So, so my so after Ms. Abriza's uh, letter, I went and took that training that she put in there. And they have a case of this actually, but it was an actual determined auto body shop that they turned into a daycare. And the ending result was they put a couple layers of wood chips and then they told the daycare not to let the kids dig in the background. So that, that was their, their rule from the state. Um, so if they choose not to do that, we can definitely contact the state because they have that safe I forget the full title, the safe something or other for daycares that we can ask them to look into it, I'm sure, and they would. Um, and they could make the ruling on what would be acceptably licensed by the state anyway. So I would assume that that would be the route to take for that process. I thought I also remember them saying they're going to put that rubber mm -hmm. over it, over the, the whole playground area. So it was really just like the landscaped areas around that might be open, mm -hmm. that that would be a risk for kids digging in those. But yeah, well, in the the one in the training also just put signs, the state required them to put signs, do not walk yeah. on the grass area. That was not covered, so. And um, do we have folks here who wanted to comment as well? Mm -hmm. question. Hi, um, so my name is Holly Clark. I live at 1652 Central Avenue, which is right next to this. And so I was here um, and I was part of the people that came when there was the hearing before the board. Um, and so one of the big issues was that the, the plan requires digging at the site map. And the newest plan that's been submitted is going to ask for a septic permit, which wasn't part of the issue before. So while the LSP said, okay, so we'll put this fill where they want to put it. And um, if anybody comes to dig later, they'll know not to dig. The question is, well, what happens First, like when you're going to dig now, what does that do to the families that live next door to it? What does it do to the workers that are going to work on it? And what precautions need to happen here? And, and that's when the board stepped in, aside from saying the board had just said there should be testing given the prior history here, that the, there was a complaint many years ago, and the photographic evidence showed that for 20 years, it wasn't just auto use, there was um, debris and, and trucks and um, it was used as a, as a construct, a, uh, uh, they were a demolition company that they ran out of here and they stored material. And we know that there was additional fill brought there, actually that we didn't even know when it came 
to the Board of Health. So there were legitimate concerns. And one of the other issues the board identified was the developer was not saying he would cover everything, he wanted to cover certain sections. And the idea was to make sure that that plan just would be correct and, and would protect everybody's safety. So um, that remains an issue. So to say, well, they're going to put you know, six inches, it's six inches greater, and is it six inches enough? I'm not saying that at the end that you might look and say, this is good, this is, this is um, best practices, and we should do it. But, the, but this is the Board of Health, and you know, to protect the health of the town and of the kids that go there, I think that's incredibly important. And again, you might end up saying fine. And I would suggest this is not, this is not just, um, you know, a house that has some left paint in and you're going to do construction, so how do we do this? There is the evidence that was presented to the board, including statements of people that had been there um, during the time when things were, were dumped in the ground. You've seen, you've seen the documented, um, this isn't just anecdotes. And I, you know, so, there's a lot more here. And in terms of the litigation, what actually got written was that the board was going to, that thought that the Board of Health was really important, but that the Board of Health had the authority to take care of it. And that's when they dropped it. And I, I think Mr. Heath may be right. It may be that they just thought, okay, that can get covered and we'll just kind of narrow the issues over here. That does happen in litigation. But that is what they wrote. That it was really important, but that the board could handle it. And I guess the other question I would have is under um, Chapter 111, Section 131, if a Board of Health has um, considers it necessary um, for health to enter any land um, to examine into and make sure to prevent any nuisance or source of illness, the Board has the authority to do that. So I haven't seen any case under that, but there is a statutory basis for the Board looking into this, as well as if they're going to come for a um, sewer permit or a uh, septic permit, then the board has authority um, just to make sure what should happen happens so that everyone is protected. And it may, again, it doesn't mean it's not going to be able to get built. It just means that it'll be built safely. So, and again, the residents, um, actually very much appreciated the board way back when this got filed because um, the residents immediately identified the concerns about the past use. And the board initially said, yes, we agree, there should be testing here. And then um, when we came um, back after the suggestion was, well, we'll do some fill, um, that's when the residents came back again. And that's when all of the evidence of what had been there. And there's photographic evidence. It's not just anecdotes and kind of worries about maybe something happened. Um, there were oil drums behind a neighbor's properties when we before the board. Like it's this isn't speculation. I, I, I certainly understand the idea that you don't want to open the floodgates, but but this if this is all over Needham, we should open the floodgates. But it's not. It's one particular use. It's right next to neighbors and it's intended for for a daycare center for little kids. So I, I just think the board um, probably has authority and discretion. And, um, and it, it, even if it's part of the, they're going to come to the, the health department to get those other permits. And maybe having it and working it out amicably, that's always a good thing. But the question was put is, is that enough? That's what the board wanted to do is get the information to make sure what was proposed was actually going to be effective. And I respectfully ask you um, to continue on that. It's the concerns, the facts haven't changed. And, and the matter, this particular piece, um, whether the town appeals the entire thing is still open, but this piece um, is not foreclosed at all. So, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Yeah, and Mrs. Chairman, I'd like to, um, there was one discrepancy that I was able to clarify that the site is going to be connected to municipal sewer. So it is not going to have a septic okay. system at that property. That was clarified. When? Right after you had sent um, that information about that, I, had, I wanted to clarify because that 
if sewer is available on the street, right. it's feasible yes. to connect yes. and they already I have you told, you told me that. What I was told was that the brand new plan has been submitted like last week. Well, I checked with building and they said they were going to still connect to sewer. If we, you know, that right. So that's fine, but they will be coming, they'll still be coming for a demolition permit. Again, one of the concerns was they said, well, in the future, if anybody digs, there'll be a notice. But this bu building will require digging now. So how does that protect everyone now? Well, I wonder if that, if the building now would fall under the Department of Environmental Protection. Mm -hmm. And the, the other question I have, since the digging would be done before any construction took place, the other question I have is, does has the Department of Environmental Protection already been made aware of this site? Because I recall from about a year and a half ago, there were a series of emails. Um, there was a concerned resident that uh, alerted the US EPA, and they alerted the state, but I don't know if it went anywhere after that. Tar, do you know anything about that? I'm pretty sure it did. I do believe so, yeah, because yeah, Tim has spoken with both DPH and Mass DEP about this as well already. I just want to just clarify one thing. And Stephen already said it. If there is sewers, uh, sewers available on the street, mm -hmm. they have to connect. Right. If it's feasible to board, connect in my terms. I think the board should go on yeah. record saying they are absolutely have to connect the sewer. Yeah. We have yeah. rates. We have rates for that. Right. We, we have that like you know, right. five, ten years. Oh, right. Really? Well, a yeah. long time. Ago. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. We've disallowed septics. So, you know, if, if they were to try to put in a septic and there's sewer available within a certain number of feet, we would say, yeah. no, you can't do that. Even yeah. somebody who's septic who had currently has a system. Right. And they're still like some in. We had this whole thing of walking mm -hmm. down, right? Yeah. Their septic system right. failed. They right. said their septic was well, not. You've got to do it at your expense. Right. right. Chris, anything else to add at this point? I was going to add to comment about the septic, uh, but that's. But, you all just did that. That's and I think that's all I have. Okay. okay. I mean, it sounds to me that um, you know it is under the jurisdiction of DEP, especially related to digging on the site, mm -hmm. and they have been made aware. Um, Tim's spoken to them. Um, if uh, the board chooses, we could send a letter to to sort of reinforce that there's a concerns that are continuing to be raised to. Um, you know, that they, I don't know what we would say, that they might want to continue to look into it or reevaluate if they want to look into it. Um, that sounds like that would be one option at least. Um, other options that anyone else wants to propose? Yeah, I think that's a very good idea. I think we should send a letter to the DEP. Just bring it back up again. And how close are we to work or not? Just in terms of going off and all that. Um, not that far. I mean, we'd have to <laughs> have to <laughs> have zero idea. Look into that. Yeah. yeah it's, it's getting close to a wetland area. So that's it's fine. it's way up. It's it's past it's, it's the up, light. It's up the hill. I know because yeah. I I walk each year. We yeah. Walk from Temple it's quite a distance. It's say like a half a mile. Maybe. <laughs> mile. Yeah. Rob, anything else that you wanted to add? Just uh, since you're not here with us. Uh, nothing, nothing further. I think it's been said. <laughs> Do we need a motion about the letter? Or is it just? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, I'll, we'll work on drafting that. Okay. okay. Again, so if, so if they decide not to do the fill, then what do we do at that point? That one, I think we have to intervene to but first, well, I guess that's my question. Do we have the jurisdiction maybe to do that? Let's say they have to. Yeah. Or how do we know that if they do or don't? The question is at the monitor. We do have the right to go on the property to look. Uh, my understanding as private property, you don't unless you're invited or there's proof. And I think the basis for this is we don't have any evidentiary proof, any written reports, any concerns that there has been a spill. Um, and so I think that's where that's where that lies and in the thought of uh, public health my thought is since the state does it the state would need to go in and fix that problem so we could also look at the state's reports on the daycare as they're building it because they have to license it and approve it and they do have to fill out that form about whether or not it's a safe site 
And I mean, if they have a building to work on, then there's building inspections and other things too that happen that we'd have to make sure they're following what they said they were going to do. But, yeah. yeah. Right. So how much of this goes to building? I mean, do we need to send a letter to you know our building department and say, look, you know, there have been <coughs> formally send a letter and say, look, there have been some concerns that there are you know potentially materials that could be hazardous on this site where there will be digging. You know, mm -hmm. you're responsible for that part of it. Demolition, we're responsible for the safe operation. Yeah. Yep. Have we done that before? Um, yeah. Has anyone done that in other <laughs> community? Well, they, in their functional communities, they communicate all the all time, time yeah. with each other and that's yeah. how things get. Maybe some of these do, but yeah. maybe we want something formal. Yeah. Like we would send a letter, like, so say a house was burned down and they had to do an asbestos and okay. couldn't access the house. We would have to do a soil test. We would re recommend building to require that as part of the demo permit. We've done okay. that before. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I think so we should just be communicating. Because when you say there's no evidentiary evidence, it's like, look, you know, okay, rusty oil drum that's been there for 20 years. Uh, you know, Short of doing a soil test, I don't know that it gets any better than that. I mean, using reasonably <coughs> the standard, right? I mean, reasonably, people are concerned, and I think it is reasonable because you know we've seen this over the years. Right? Yeah, I think one of the concerns is litigation, though. If we end up in litigation, that's where yeah, we might. But that but that would be the standard, right? You know, did we have a reasonable basis for this or not? You know, and but I but I agree. I think we should exhaust you know every other avenue that we can take first before we start going there. All right, so we'll do two letters. I was just gonna say, it should be easy to tell if the if the grades shown on the approved plans change. And those approved plans should have shown the grades, including the fill, yeah. the applicant representative they would put in. Okay. And the inspections when they're in permanent. So that, okay. that should be something that the building department ought to be able to deduce when we're doing building current plans and ought to be able to communicate back to you guys uh, if and when it happens. So we'll do two letters as discussed, and uh, I think that covers it. Do you have any more thoughts, Jane? I would just, um, to make everyone feel a little bit more comfortable, hopefully, um, you always have the option if, if if things aren't going according to plan, and if you you have any concerns, you can always utilize Chapter 111, Section 122, the nuisance statute. Sure. So, you know, you do have some authority if things, if, if things aren't going the way um, you expect them to, that statute is available. And maybe in that letter to the building department, we can have a kind of closed loop uh, piece as well that when they've inspected or whatever, it'd be nice for us to, to know that, that occurred and that they were comfortable or, yeah. So. Can, can somebody just, but public nuisance, isn't that kind of a high bar? Case well, I'm not a lawyer, but you guys know. It, well, the statute is very, very broad. Right. Um, it's it's the most impenetrable jungle in the entire right. law is <laughs> part of the problem. <laughs> but um, that's from a textbook. But okay. but it is a law that can be used if you are concerned that something may cause danger to public health. It's a law that can be utilized. But. <laughs> well, we're not going there. It, yes. no. It's a catch-all. Catch yeah. yeah. Um, I would, yeah. We'd want to see the facts as they exist. Yeah, yeah. Right. it's just, it, it exists. Right. Yeah, okay. All right. I think we can move on to our next item. Um, all right. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of our guests today and visitors. Um, Julie, we're moving into biosafety. Yes, uh, so I wanted to allow the two um, sort of prospective biosafety committee members to introduce themselves. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, if you want to come up to the table, and John should be online. So Justin McCollin and John Portman. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And introduce yeah. themselves and, and have a discussion with you. All right, well, while we're waiting on John, thank you. And well, definitely thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Justin McCullen. I'm a resident for uh, Needham for about 10 years. I have two kids in the district. Um, I have been since probably 2014 involved in town government uh, at various um, capacities uh, with transportation, traffic safety. Um, now on the quiet zone committee, town meeting member, 
actually, I, Doug Fox was just saying, oh, you have spare time. So that's why you're coming to this. <laughs> uh, I have so much spare time. Um, but professionally, uh, I do risk management and emergency management uh, at uh, Novartis. Um, and I actually do that from within the environmental health and safety, or as we call it, health safety environment. This is an international term versus, versus the US based. Um, but, uh, and prior to that, I was at Data Farber um, uh, and also did emergency management and business continuity from um, environmental health and safety. At Dana Farber, I sat on the Aya Cook uh, committee as a representative for um, uh, for the biosafety for uh, to, to sit from an EHS perspective. Similarly, um, at, um, at Novartis, I also serve on the, uh, the Aya Cook um, and the biosafety committee, um, just from planning perspective and et cetera. So, from the vantage point of emergency planning and uh, et cetera, um, that's that's the perspective that I bring. Um, but um, so. I mean, essentially, this is an opportunity for you to ask any any questions that you have with regards to um, uh, you know any interest you have or any any, any questions. Um, why don't we have our other uh, colleague introduce himself and then we'll see if there's questions. John, sure. if you want to go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is John Portman. Um, my wife and I moved to Needham actually just this year, uh, but my wife grew up in Needham. Her family still lives here, so we have strong ties here. Um, I received my PhD in infectious disease and immunology from UC Berkeley, um, moved to Boston with my wife, went to Harvard Medical School, have been in Cambridge Biotech for about a half dozen years. Um, basically everywhere I've been, I've been sort of immersed in the safety program. Safety is kind of one of those things that not a lot of people like to undertake because <laughs> it's basically like lab police. It gets called like, you know, commonly, um, but I think it's super important and it's just kind of been integrated into a part of my professional career at this point. So I've been officially biosafety officer in Cambridge for about five years. Um, Sam Lipson does a great job in Cambridge. So I've written our biosafety protocols, done amendments, um, involved in our IACUC writing and amend, uh, protocols for all of our animal work. Um, yeah, just been fully ingrained <laughs> for a long time now. Uh, I'm ed by an infectious disease immunologist by training. So we've done I've overseen risk assessments and biosafety procedures uh, through the very limit of biosafety level two. So clinical staff, C. diff, um, lots of other pathogens um, all the way through that. So pretty confident up to that level as far as biosafety is concerned. Any questions from our board members? Um, I don't have a question. I just, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the, uh, resources we have in this town and i think you guys just proved it <laughs> it's, it's incredible and they're, they're, i think it's a wonderful addition to this committee i, I guess I, i'll ask oh, um, <laughs> it, it, um I, i'm always asking questions sorry um, right. yeah. what like kind of maybe for both of you what do you think the number one citizen concern would be and like how would you address it for like a facility coming in to need them so I don't know. I mean, the, the, the number one concern, I mean, concern, I think, well, I think, I think there's perceived concern. And there's actually real right. concern. Okay. So I think from, from an education and outreach perspective, there is, there is a gap uh, mm -hmm. in terms of what is, what is true risk? What is, what is true is, 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 is you know, is there a pathogen that's going to leak out of my foot mm -hmm. and go, you know, as a, mm -hmm. or, you know, um, just because you, you hear, we hear these scary words of the SL four, three, two, you know, mm -hmm. two, two plus. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's, it, it, there's an education component. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the, the biosafety committee or the town could certainly through its communication officer uh, help to educate. And so we can actually then, then see what the actual risk is. You know, um, a lot of, I mean, as all the stuff in Cambridge, a lot of it's very relatively low risk. It's not, you know what I mean? It's just working in a bio, in a bio safety cabinet doing it to mm -hmm. um, You know, it, it's it's rare that you're actually finding some pathogens that are actually truly, uh, truly dangerous that are going to be, you know, uh, worked on uh, at, a, at, at a normal biotech. But, you know, we, we do have to look at them, see what the risk assessments are, go through the process. That's an established process, as we all know, um, you know, to, to, to mitigate risk. And so um, I think, just by by following established processes, but also reaching out to the community by actually trying to educate them on, um, you know, what is actual perceived risk versus actual risk is, is, is a big concern. And, I, and that's been on 
uh, a lot of scuttlebutt with regards to, um, you know, that it has either appeared here or appeared online um, with, you know, what, what truly is, are we going to have a BSL-4? <laughs> no, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, but, you know, this, this is what BSL-4 is. This is what this is, you know, this is. So I think education is very important, um, you know, to, to that community outreach. John, anything you'd add? Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, you yeah, know, that's, yeah, agree across the board, all the comments. Um, I think the other thing that sort of strikes me from the biosafety perspective is the biosafety committee is really one of the few levers that the community at large has into the inner workings of lab work at different companies. And different companies, if, you, if, if a company doesn't necessarily have a champion of safety, Safety can go off the rails pretty quickly. <laughs> and so having a biosafety committee that's conservative yet practical and can work hand in hand with the company. Again, I don't work for Sam or anything, but like he's done a really great job in Cambridge of, I'm not scared to reach out to him for questions because I know he's not gonna come down on us where it's really like this mutual back and forth of, hey, we're considering doing this. It's you know, on a risk scale, it's not zero, it's like four or something. What do you think about that? How do you think about mitigating this risk, engineering controls, things like that? Um, and then the town gets kind of a lever into the inner workings just to kind of keep tabs on things. Um, there is MWRA, I think a lot about wastewater. Um, and MWRA does a, a reasonable job of like telling you what you can and can't put down the sink, but there's not really a lot of like periodic insight into processes that are generating weights that could be going down the sink. So in this legacy of like our DNA permits and biosafety committees and how that has sort of overseen biotech, I think of it almost less as biosafety and more like safety that's like rooted in biosafety. And so you can kind of also keep tabs on what are you putting down the drain? Is it properly decontaminated? Um, you know, obviously that's one small component of biosafety, but biosafety officers typically kind of oversee a lot of the inner workings. Um, so I think that's also a, the best lever for the community at large to keep either you know the employees safe the community safe wastewater that as much larger community impacts um to our entire water supply so well um uh first of all i have to say i am a safety person as well patient safety in the hospital setting so i know what you mean about no one likes when safety people come around <laughs> But uh, it's a really important function. And so I want to echo what Ed has said, that it is amazing the resources we have in this town. I appreciate the two of you being willing to participate on this. I mean, it's a, it's a new, quote, new area for us in terms of the new regulations that we created, creating this committee, et cetera. So I think, you know, we're going to definitely need the expertise that, uh, that you two can bring. And, you know, if there's things that need to be added or changed to our regulations over time as we go forward, et cetera, we're certainly... You know, that's the kind of input that, that we would like to hear. Um, any other comments? Rob? Yeah. I, yeah. Um, again, I want to echo what Ed and you have just said, uh, and thank you both for being willing to participate and bringing your expertise. Um, and I, I guess the one question I just have to ask is, um, do you anticipate any conflicts of interest with your current work or previous relationships you've had? Uh, in terms of sitting on this committee, which is a small committee, it's only four people. I think it's possible. <laughs> um, actively working in biotech, especially I work in R&D at a small biotech firm. Um, I think e either there would have to be an outlet to recuse yourself from something or, you know, I guess, I don't know, some sort of professionalism I, involved absolutely but it, it's possible that it would arise i mean inherently yeah, no, I, when you're talking about risky processes it's like proprietary information and stuff so you know you could foresee that happening for sure and i mean I, you know it's certainly possible i think the, the outlet is that you know we would expect that if you if you recognize that conflict that you would recuse yourself yeah absolutely just to, just to echo um the uh Interesting, I had just, my function has just moved to now ethics, risk, and compliance um, out of HSE. Um, but, and so there is, um, there, there is significant um, uh, 
emphasis on you know basically being to to, to self-report and always being aware and kind of horizon scanning of your perceived conflicts and obviously if there was a you know a company that either i was aware of directly or indirectly involved in then i would obviously have to recuse myself based on on, on that permit um or, or they're seeking you know authorization but um just to kind of echo that but yes that's i think I don't know, you know, it's, it's outside the regular conflict of interest from the state because that doesn't look at that level in terms of, you know, proprietary information as was shared. But mm -hmm. so that would, I would definitely recuse myself if there was an, an issue. Thank, thank you. All right. Great. So thank you to Justin and John for introducing yourselves. Uh, I wanted to give sort of one more update that um, Cy has worked very hard <laughs> on revamping the um, online permit. So previously it was the biosafety registration. It was a much smaller online sort of application for um, the permit. And now it is, we make people work for it. Let's say that. <laughs> um, it's long. So Cy went through and um, we had a meeting with IT and we added in all of the requirements from the biosafety regulation into the permit. Uh, Cy worked very hard to make it go live already. We've already had a company reach out about the new um, permit. So maybe we'll get to try this whole process out um, very soon. Uh, Cy also reached out to the two companies in town that exist and previously had the biotechnology registration to reapply under this new biosafety permit now that it's live. Um, so we should get cracking soon. Um, what was their response when you reached out to those two companies? They weren't aware of like new regulations to begin with. So they're like, oh, this is new, but they're not willing to like apply as soon as possible. Yeah, they didn't seem off the bio. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing all that work to get that live. Um, and yeah, Julie, if you can keep us updated on kind of, you know, are we getting a lot of applications in or yeah, how that process absolutely. is going? Great. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for coming. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Given the face of the boat and <clears throat> what's coming to the house. I think uh, we definitely had to do what we had. Yeah. And I just think, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm reading, really, you know, their uh, CDs. Yeah. And, oh my God. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, mean, I feel better. So we have, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We've got a lot of impressive talent in town. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, let's move on to Sandbox Review. Jenny and Tiffany. Yes. yes. Jenny, take the lead on that. So, Sandbox, it's an opioid harm reduction initiative that brings education and awareness um, of the Massachusetts Good Samaritan Law and the Ogre's Assistant Immunity Law. So it's basically, think about like a first aid kit but with Narcan in it. Um, so the sandboxes are designed to contain Narcan that has to be supplied by the businesses or the local public health like ours. Um, directions for administering Narcan, so it has a little, um, like a little, Put in it, um, CPR rescue breathing barriers and gloves. Um, and I did put in a picture of what it would look like. Um, it is technically like a locked box, so it has like the little sticky plastic strip on it. So when it gets the seal gets broken, it has to be replaced because you don't have to replace the Narcan and probably the CPR barrier. And these are being distributed through MHOA, and they do cost 285 a box. But what we were thinking is we would kind of funding somehow and see where we could put these. We were hoping to have them at the RRC, at the library, um, maybe the schools, um, especially the library staff. They have been trying to use Narcan, but we can be just in time creating in case another business wants to have these in their um, building as well. Um, the one situation I can always see is how we would check up on these and see how we can maintain them. So we'd have to have like a cooperation with us and whoever is sponsoring these boxes to let us know we need to replace the Narcan um, and whatever else that they use in it. $285,000. That was good. That was good. That was good. That was yeah, yeah. Right oh, I thought they were like 50 bucks, so we were planning out money, and I was like, yeah. all right, yeah, let's, yeah. and then I looked the price, and I was like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> so, a couple of questions there, right? So, yeah. one, DIY do, they have, do they have, <laughs> why are you using this product? Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming there may be some competitors. Yeah. Um, we could put something together like this for a whole lot less <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. ourselves. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's a box with a safety strap and a mask. 
you know, and there's Narcan that has to be swapped in and out. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, you know, if no, we, I we really want this to do, if we really want this to do some good, I mean, yeah, yeah this is nice that it's, that it's packaged as a slick commercial kit, but this is extraordinarily expensive. I mean, this cost them, you know, probably under $10 to produce, right? Yeah. Yeah. What about like, sorry, I'm not a professional in this field, but if these places that have AEDs, like, can't you just stick it in there with it? Like so that was, or something? that was the original thought, I think, uh, before these sandboxes. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, though, we have all the opioid use uh, mitigation funding coming in. Oh, no. And so that was the thought to use some of the money on this as a harm reduction that we can show mm -hmm. um, the state that we are utilizing this money. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of one part of this process um but that was the other thought the the same thing then goes back to who's going to monitor them and who's going to make sure the expiration dates and things like that mm -hmm. um depending on where we take them and where we where we hand them out mm -hmm. so so this is one good tool and yes we could definitely look at alternatives and things like that as long as we just want to see your guys' thoughts on offering something like this version um with Ginny and hannah and the SPAN team, specifically Angie, uh, this month have done amazing on training with opioid, with Narcan and done 40 doses to a lot of parents, um, high school and college both. Mm -hmm. So um, just this last month. So it's, it's been awesome. So there's definitely an interest. So yeah. uh, one thing I don't see on this that should be like front and center is called 911. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like written right at the very bottom, like signs of overdose. And it's yeah. big and they're like, call 911. I'm like, but that's like what we emphasize when we do the training, like yeah, call that one. Yeah, like, do that. yeah I don't, I don't see it on the on the box anywhere. I mean, I'm looking here. It's not there. Maybe you might just stop it. I don't know. No, I don't. Yeah, I'm not. Oh, you zoomed in. Oh, I can't see it. Yeah, it's not there. That's cool. So, where you, who decided to use this particular? product that's 285 dollars like is this through the state it's, it looks well so this one is mhoa i believe it looks like they have their symbol on there yeah, they do. plus yeah. mrc i see an mrc symbol mm -hmm. on there mm -hmm. so this looks like a initiative um done with those groups i didn't actually look at this version i looked at the actual sandbox themselves um so their packaging looks a little different than this um on the actual sandbox um so yeah we could definitely look and see what what there is out there, what versions, yeah. what we can yeah. do, what what we could provide versus, or they are paying a discount, for, yeah, you know, for government as opposed yeah. to private. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so. definitely a good idea. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the maintenance piece is important though, because I mean, how many times have we seen that you know things get used and then they're sitting there, and then the next time you realize, oh no, there's nothing in it. So and that piece, yeah, that's been like the consensus when we've done the training is people are just like we just want to have it just in case, and that would probably be the biggest push for me at least for presenting this to everybody, but. Um, I also don't want Renarkin to never not be there. Right. Like this was the whole point of us exactly. raising awareness. Mm -hmm. So that's why I would really emphasize if it gets used to just please tell us as soon as possible. We, I can get cases of Narcan pretty easily. Like I just got 72 doses from VA Ryan's office for free. So it's not like it, the reporters sort of wouldn't be that difficult. There might be a way to, in terms of the EMTs or whoever would respond, like have some way that they can communicate as well it's just hard you know yeah. when you rely on sure. a whole range of yeah. people to communicate it often can break down whereas if there was some protocol where they have to notify if they see one used yeah you know i'm thinking of distribution too like you know wherever there are like na or a meetings held like churches mm -hmm. and things okay. like oh, distributing yeah. there i think mm -hmm. would be really you know in terms of supply replenishment, that, I mean, yes, you can get it free, but that, that would be an easy thing to approach, you know, what would the CVS for sponsorship. So actually, our CVS, CVS, stop carrying it. We won't provide it anymore. I believe under state law, they have to. I know, but they told a resident when they came to us that they are not carrying it any longer. Then you need to know <laughs> state about that. That's, that's a problem. Yeah. Okay. That's the state law. They have to carry it, and they have to make it available. <laughs> That's not that's not optional for them. Okay, so maybe more to come. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just like, great, we like the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know we can get it cheaper, or if there's like a bulk order discount or something. Yeah, yeah. I think she was right. It's probably about ten dollars worth of stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah, but if we do this. It's important that one person be responsible for it. Mm -hmm. That 
you know exactly what locations we can place mm -hmm. these in and work out some kind of a schedule that you can fit into your other work schedule for just regularly checking. Mm -hmm. And if we do that. Yeah, I could loop in with our AED checks. Those are twice a year anyway. Yeah. Obviously, there. the people that do those wouldn't do it, but we could go along and do some yeah. create something kind of mm -hmm. schedule with that as well. And I think the community education then as well about kind of these. I mean, there's yeah. so much education about AEDs and people know to look for an AED. So kind of that the same box of yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, let's talk about body art. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so we got an inquiry. Uh, I will say a couple of months ago now that a practitioner uh, wants to do some micro blading, like makeup type cosmetic work. Yeah. And so I said, yep, that requires a body art permit. We have our regulations. I gave them to her. Um, she's going to be looking to have it in an existing salon and have a separate room. Like we, we went through all the regulation requirements that we have on, on the books for, for this. And we adopted the MHOA model regulations, as you may or may not recall. But this is what we took. Um, we gave her a copy of this. We do not currently have an online permit for this yet because we've never had an inquiry come in. So now we're, we're I'm working with Sai and IT to get a copy of this online. Um, and one of the things we noticed, um, there's one thing we had in here was the fee that was listed and it's an outdated fee. And I highlighted that. So we'd have to remove that. And I was thinking we could use the same wording that we have under the practitioner permit section, which is the 7.12.16, basically, and put that under the establishment permit section if we want to keep it so that it's always um, adjustable, the fee. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That might be an idea to do that. If you're right. just referring to our other fee schedule. Right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. correct. So it's not a definite fee. So yeah. we can make mm -hmm. that change real quick. The other items I pointed out, um, and I as well, that we, for our body work permits application requirements require Corey Sori for the practitioner. I didn't know uh, if the board felt that that should be added because I didn't see it in here. It might be something to consider. And then the other thing was the hep, uh, A shot right? mm -hmm. that, that yeah. said shall be vaccinated against hep A. We didn't know. Uh, hep, hep B, sorry. I think it was hep B. Um, but that was the question. Do we want to have that be must? Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two questions we had on that. To get your input. On I, I would I would certainly agree with the shall for the hep B if they're going to be microblading and you know there's yeah. going to be broken skin involved. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think post 1995 or 96, uh, every, everybody uh, who grows up in America has it. So. Um, or almost everyone. So most people will be in compliance anyway, but I think it's reasonable to require it, yes. Okay. So let me, let me ask, because maybe I just don't understand anything about microblading. Um, this is Rob, I agree. I mean, I think everybody should, but the shall is, is a little bit more of a barrier. Um, I mean, you know, we don't, we're not, I mean, most healthcare workers already have it uh, for their own protection, but you know, the only required vaccinations I think I have to get, you know, at, at work, I think, are flu or, or what have you each year, and the, and the COVID vaccine at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a, a substantial risk that the practitioner is going to lacerate themselves, you know, as part of a microblading or, or a body art procedure, um, as opposed to anything else? Because otherwise, why aren't we requiring everybody who's giving an injection to also, you know, be heavily vaccinated? Again, they probably already are. But what's the difference? Um, I, I mean, I guess I, maybe I don't know enough about microblading and how they protect their hands or what have you. But if they have any open wounds, that was, that's my main concern. That an unvaccinated uh, practitioner would infect someone, so they would the the potential. The, Right, that's that's the concern. Yeah. Is, is that the practitioner, right. right? So, but the practitioner would have to have open sores or broken skin, mm -hmm. you know. Because that's a blood. Again, I mean, like transfer. anybody else who's administering, you know, yeah. a, a vaccine to somebody or an injection to somebody, you could also make that argument. Unless there's, you know, something about microblading that okay, it's much closer contact, it's much more sustained contact. I mean, I'm just looking for a rationale. Well, that's is all. it say they have to use gloves? They have to use gloves. They should not have any open rash or infection or open wounds. I mean, obviously they have to. 
follow this regulation, but in the regulation it says that no, they shouldn't have that stuff. So, um, but for like a tattoo artist, do they also is it shall for them? So it's the same requirement. It's the same regulation, right? Okay. So, yeah, so that's the question. So are we going yeah, to that? Yeah, we're going to require everyone. Microblading, they do work more on the eyes, I believe, like the eyeliner and the mm -hmm. that type of thing, which, yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. But, <laughs> but the gloves should be intact, right? They right. should be changing them often. Yeah. And we still remind food establishments to change gloves. Right. It's amazing. What How exactly is the process of microblading? They put a tattoo, right, under your eye, like as eyeliner. Uh -huh. And then I, I think they do their eyebrows, too. Yeah, they do eyebrows. Eyebrows, yeah. yeah. That's a big trend Yeah. right now. That. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, in terms of the quarry stuff, uh, you said it's like a private, separate room. Uh, yeah. So they have to, have, and according to the, the code of, of, you know, we also require that, and we took this from the, the MHOA model regs. They have to have a separate room that's not included. It's 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 an offshoot room that has a door that allows privacy, like similar to a body work room. But mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like massage. Yeah. So it kind of clued us in thinking, well, should they be Corey Sorry? You know, yeah, that was just a question. The machine is like a reasonable. Oh, yeah. 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 That seems reasonable. That one seems yeah. reasonable. Yeah. 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 I would be more worried about that, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have to come in anyway to show our, their ID. So it's not like an ex not much extra work to have yeah. to them. Okay. So, okay. Um, I could say that, like, none of the other neighboring towns that have body art regulations have a Cori Sori, like, yeah. stipulation in their regulations. I think they're all based off the model regs for, yeah. for the most oh. part. So, I mean, none, none of the other towns have kind of yeah. gone more with that, but maybe it's a good idea to include it. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. And is there a cost to that? No. Oh, oh. But okay. I mean, they have an application cost, but okay. the Cori Sori is part okay. of it, and that's not extra. Just okay. bring it up. What are the other towns doing in terms of I looked through Fox. Well, like I looked through a couple of the ones I was surrounding. I didn't see it in theirs either, but they all adopted this. So it almost seemed like it was identical. Everyone just adopted MHA way, you know, model mm -hmm. regs. Yeah. So I was like, it's not in there. So mm -hmm. yeah, didn't really see any of that. The ones that I, the few that I checked. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. can I ask, how do you monitor that now with Happy? Uh, so we, when we do body works, we, we have them submit a letter from a doctor oh. that states they're in good health, vaccines up to date, you know, that whole thing. It's a very general okay, letter, but uh, we had a, a specific, you know, line in here about that B and that's what caught our eye mm -hmm. and said, shall. Yeah. So we weren't sure since we're updating it anyway, I figured yeah. uh, right now it says well. should be, sorry, right now it says should, should be. be correct. And then instead of shall. Yeah. When was the last time we updated these that looked at them? So I think it's on the back here. <laughs> so September 16th, September uh, 2016. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah. The last time. Just as a point of information, so as a point of favor for um, King Talk Lines, um, we had to go through for all of them, we had to. the rationale it's like look patient contact you know that an establishment need and we're going to require this it's not like it's that owner side right i mean it's you know it's, it's two injections it's not a big deal um you know so be it you know i mean i'm i'm fine with that i just want to yeah i just want to have some sort of a, a, a logical rationale for why we're making that step That's inconsistency all. exactly well mo yeah. most people already have it and and also it's you know from from the i think from the board of health standpoint if we require it then it's done, you know, then we won't have to worry about, you know, the glove use, the potential open sores, the broken glove, like it's, it's covered. Oh, yeah, this is still HIV. That's true. Well, I was going to say too, if we do have, like, why are we not doing HIV, right? Like then, it, you know, there's, right. Well, 
vaccine. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, but, but, but this is but this is low bar. This is yeah. this is easy, this is, right? Yeah. I think we that should. I don't know. We're yeah. gonna get like one. Yeah, there's also Let's another see. section for record keeping under 7.6.5 about employee information, which says employee information shall which shall include have the vaccination status or declin uh, declination of notification. So there's a shell there, but we would should somewhere else. So like but it's a shell for notification. For notification and they can decline notifying us about the have the vaccination as well. So it's sort of like HIPAA protected, mm -hmm. I'm guessing, mm -hmm. right? So. Is um, it the only required vaccine? Seems like it is. Oh, yeah, I think just make it should. Let's yeah. not dig into, I mean, I don't know if that's my view, mm -hmm. not dig into every vaccine for every job yeah. and task, but. Okay. okay. All right, so change it to should. And then on the, sorry, on the uh, establishment record keeping, uh, we should just keep it as shell. Shell, okay. Yeah. okay. And then for the quarry story, should we add that? that. Uh, yeah. 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 And think, we'll revise the fee statement. Yeah. 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 Perfect. And then what would happen is that we would make those changes, have the hearing next month. You know, we'd be able to post for our two weeks before the meeting and then just vote on the changes then. It seems like in all of our regs, we should probably have the fee statement yeah. base, see the schedule yeah. of fees, yeah. you know. Yeah. So um, I think you're right. Yeah. As we go through, I notice that in other communities. Okay. Separate. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Okay. Um, next is the code of conduct discussion. To that show. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the Tim's not here, so um, really, I think the thought was just if you guys were able to read through it, is this something you guys would like to adopt and adjust something similar to this for the board? Of and do you know if other boards besides the select board are doing that? Or? I think it's been brought to other boards, but I don't know. I have not heard, but I don't know either if other boards are adopting something similar. Does anyone know what, so was this put in place because of that state um, case that basically said, you know, you can be rude and nasty in a meeting and it's fine. I mean, oh. and you have to let the person speak. I don't know if that's in the reason why it was done, but I'm okay. sure that has something okay. to do with. Okay. Yeah. What was the state? So, I mean, there was this the state case, there was a local meeting in Massachusetts, there was a MH, uh, the Mass Association mm -hmm. of Health Boards had a training recently I went to, and it, it was a state case where someone came to the meeting and was really nasty, and they cut them off and said, you're not going to talk to us that way, and basically they sued for freedom of speech and won. Mm -hmm. So basically, your only recourse if someone comes to the meeting and is like, you know, really nasty um, is to end the meeting. That, that was what we were told in that training. Um, and so I didn't know, but maybe this is like when you codify your meeting uh, criteria or whatever, um, that that's a way to, to require people. But maybe this is also just about the board. This is not the so members, much about the public. Us, and not members. so much about the other people. So, I mean, most of this is, seems to be kind of common sense, right? It wasn't like yeah, so it's kind of like, I don't know if you guys have ever sat in Chris's trainings that he's done in years prior about how boards should act. Or, I, I feel like this is the select board taking that and putting that down on paper as okay. we will okay. act in this way. Okay. Um, and I was just notified that it was in before the state case. Oh, um, okay. So they started this okay. process before and it was sent to all of their boards. Okay. I mean, there was nothing controversial in it. The question is, do we feel like we okay, want to do it or need it? Because it, it's a little bit, you know, longer than what I would want to see. <laughs> it's more, an everything. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A little bit more detail. You know, I mean, some of this too. You know, um, you know, like two point three. You know, in preparation for a public meeting, kind of members will refrain from taking public stances on pending agenda items. You may have already taken a public stance on a pending agenda item. Mm -hmm. You know, well then, what are you supposed to do, right? Yeah. Um, you know, 
you may have you know run your campaign to be on this board on a platform that says you know you're going to to do this right so or as a I, position I, you've been out there talking about tobacco cessation or whatever yeah right so so i think that you know this would need to be tweaked a little bit sure yeah you know, i mean we can't we can definitely things. make our own if you guys think that this is something you'd like yeah. to have i mean I, th I think the idea in general is, is a good one i think that we could boil it down to you know principles of you know courtesy yeah. and respect and, and what have you um, I mean, as I said, this, this gets into very specifics and, and even this, you know, um, you know like 2.2 .2 is very specific for a five person board. Um, so it doesn't allow for flexibility in terms of numbers because, you know, it says you, you only talk to one other member. It's like, well, that's fine if you're a five person board, but guess what? If you move to seven, suddenly you can talk to two, yeah. you know, and if you're three, you can't talk to anybody. <laughs> We were, we were there for a long time. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, was, I was afraid to run into you guys in the grocery store. Um, but I think we could tweak it. I mean, I think there are important things here about conflicts of interest and other stuff that, you know, it's just always good to have kind of some initial guidelines on some of these things. But I think we could maybe pare it down a bit and tweak some of the language. Okay. Um, I don't know if I know what you guys would want to pare down or tweak. Maybe Tim might have more when he gets back. So maybe we can table this a little bit and I'll have Tim check it out when he is back and then we'll bring it back up again sure. and do that. Does that work? It also is very, like, I think for us, it's very formal, like in a sense, just some guidelines. This is, you know, I don't know. It, I, I'm always worried about codifying something that isn't, you know, then you're, stuck to it. then you're, yeah. I mean, things change. I don't know. Stuff could shift. Um, although most of it's pretty basic. That, that's why I was suggesting just leaving it broader and a little bit less specific. Yeah, less detailed. Yeah, I think that's fine. I can probably do that. Yeah. Okay, all right, good. thank you. Okay, uh, staff updates. We're actually ahead of schedule, <laughs> um, All right, so emergency management. Michael, oh, sorry. Michael is um, in active duty right now, or his week thingy that he's doing. So he's not here. Okay. Any questions I can bring back to him, but I don't have too many answers. For him. I was just curious about, um, you know, he talks about the flood response and the uh, helping to advocate for federal assistance, et cetera. Um, did we, maybe I'm just not remembering, summer brain. Um, did we see the after action report or like, so what, what were the key findings from the after action report after the flooding? Just because I know there were a lot of issues. Obviously. Yeah. So some of the key findings, if I can remember from the meeting were um, one, not enough communication between the different departments because everybody's on a different radio frequency. So one, tap, one part of the group was doing one thing versus the other was doing another. Um, a lot of it had to focus on DPW and how they felt they responded to what could happen. But then part of the, our um, portion for after action was quicker information to residents about how to clean up and how to keep yourself safe. A um, couple other things. I do believe he wrote an actual action after action I can send to you guys, but I, I think those are the key things. Most of them had to do with DPW in that process. And then the town was looking at whether to do a separate site for certain types of emergencies or not and things like that. So those were the ones I can um okay uh emergency preparedness yeah uh, good morning everyone uh so uh summary uh, of emergency preparedness activities uh ongoing to work toward our proposed uh, 2023-24 board of health uh, uh, goals uh so one we uh, junior uh, junior mrc program has been initiated initiated uh, started and working on drafting a plan for that. Uh, we are going to uh, bringing a new uh, generation of volunteers. Uh, we are going to engage in high school students. Uh, to uh, continuing uh, to coordinate with the trainers at local and non-local uh, level uh, to come and speak to our volunteers. So uh, we had um, we had a meeting with uh, a trainer. Uh, who uh, uh, works through the Massachusetts uh, Office on Disability uh, to facilitate a training uh, on, uh, on individual emergency preparedness for people with disabilities. Uh, 
um, for uh, th three coordinating with the uh, non-medical volunteers to assist nurse unit uh, with September and October vac vaccination clinics. Um, also, uh, we coordinated with the Needham police um, at visiting uh, Rosemary building uh, for walkthrough um, and will run uh, active threat drill uh, this month on the 21st for uh, Rosemary staff members. Uh, and continuing uh, work on accreditation, uh, documentation, and uh, reviewed the progress with uh, Lynn uh, on August. So this is uh, pretty much uh, our activities in general. Uh, so feel free if you have any questions. The MRC Junior Program, that's a great idea. How, how many students are interested? Well, we don't have that yet. Not yet. Yeah, we're, wait, we're writing up the plan, the okay. process. Correct, and waiting on a couple of forms, I think. I think, right, Allison, with that? Yes, yes. Yeah, great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Any questions? No? All right, thank you. Welcome. Um, okay, accreditation, Lynn and Cindy. Um, Cindy has left Needham Public Health. She's gone to CDC, so oh, it's me. <laughs> um, so the, there are three things I wanted to highlight on the monthly report. The brand strategy development, the strategic planning and readiness assessment. Um, the members of the board will be contacted um, about both the brand strategy and strategic planning. We have contracted with um, BME for the strategic planning and with more advertising for brand development. So you'll be contacted. Um, the readiness assessment is the biggest item right now. So we are required to submit, to formally submit our readiness assessment next week on Friday. <laughs> um, and it's very exciting and a little daunting. Um, what happens with the readiness assessment is after the Public Health Accreditation Board gets our report, they'll review it, they have two months to review it, and they will come back with a recommendation um, to that we should go ahead and apply for accreditation, which we must do within a year, or that we're not quite ready and maybe we should put it off for another year or that we should pursue pathways, which is a less than accreditation. So there's a lot riding on this and um, I think we'll get there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Thanks Getting for all in. the hard work. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, traveling meals. Yeah, um, unless you have any questions, Rebecca's doing her meal program, so. I have one, just a suggestion. Yeah. But we get the year in, the year in, year out um, graph. Mm -hmm. It always seems like we're going to have more and more and more. <laughs> okay. Would it make more sense to have like a five year running average as a comparison or something like that? Okay. You know, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise we, we just, we're kind of losing track of, you know, how yeah. much we've gone up over the course of mm. this many years. Yeah, yeah. sure. Longer trend. Yeah. Okay, I can mention that to Rebecca. Yeah. See if we can put it on there somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, that a thousand meals last month, you know, it may have been eight hundred, you know, three years ago. Right. And that, that's a really big change. Yeah. And that's what that was. Yeah, okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Can make that suggestion. Okay, thank you. Epidemiology. Oh, um, I don't think I have anything really specific. Um, I've been working a lot with it on accreditation projects, our community health assessment, which we hope to have done very soon, um, and our community health improvement plan, which will be sort of the specific actions we choose to take from the community health assessment data. Um, working a lot on, you know, forming a biosafety committee and working on the getting that permit all set 
um, I think we're approaching, I guess, that time of year where I will maybe put COVID trends back in here. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I didn't include it in this report, but in future reports, if there's anything sort of interesting and notable, and, and I'll keep track of our vaccination rates and all of that to report back to us. Yeah, are we going to be getting any vaccine the public administration or not? So, the, uh, we'd have to pay for it. So, the goal is yes, it's just we're all waiting to see when it's approved. Yeah. So, but the goal is yes, hopefully. Yeah, because hopefully we can hand that in a blue hand. Yes, yes. that would be nice, but they keep telling us it's going to be out mid September, which we start our food clinics on the 12th. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, if we can buy it real fast, it'll be delivered real fast. Yeah. So. yeah, and I guess like other vaccine, other childhood vaccines, like I, mean, I know we're a pretty captive audience here <laughs> in Massachusetts, but like have been declining, right? Even MMR, mm -hmm. you know. We should just make sure that we're staying on track. I don't know how we track that childhood vaccinations. So we don't, the schools can, and yeah. we could get that information probably from the schools. Mm -hmm. Ginny, I'm assuming we'll talk about this in her report because mm -hmm. she did a nice little campaign about getting your childhood vaccine. Oh, yes. That's good. Um, yeah. And we did put out information that they can come, especially if they don't have insurance, please call us. And yeah. We'll help that. Oh, good. I, I know that there's a lot going on with the migrant situation yeah. in other towns. Okay. Um, so working on how we would respond to that as a unit, especially with NC8 right. or with Charles River. Um, yeah, it's something we're also working too, on. I'm yeah. trying to figure out that the state's uh, mobile vaccination team is very far out booked. Yeah, okay. so we would be, I would assume, we'd be taking the lead on vaccinations in that grant round as well. Okay, maybe work with Eden Peds or something to yeah. see what we can. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all set, Julie. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to go back on one thing. Yeah. About vaccinations for COVID and you know, influenza. Uh, given, okay, we're going to have to pay for the, the, the new booster and all that. Are we still going to run um, a, a, like a, a clinic for it, like we had a in the past, or is like, it just going to be like a separate home? COVID clinic? Yeah. I think the plan would be to get a couple hundred at least to start and then do them. Same case at the same time as our flu clinics, mm -hmm. so they could come for one or both, right? Um, and then we could do separate ones if need be. Yeah, okay. yeah, that would be the goal. And are we, Jenny, maybe talking about this? I mean, I know there's also a new RSV one that will be for yes. over so, 65, right? So, funny enough, <laughs> Tiffany had set up a, um, an MEP gym meeting with a fun RSV rep from GSK, um, and we did find out Percy. For it, so we're just kind of figuring out what the best route is. We have gotten a lot of interest in, and I have gotten emails and phone calls from us and asking if we have it. Next, stay tuned, we'll announce it. But yeah. and even us, you know, education just because it's a new vaccine, like, do we need right. to do anything? That and also insurance coverage is the other big one. Mm -hmm. um, so what we guesstimated for us was $274 a dose. Yeah. And Right now, they can only tell us one insurance company would cover it, which is Blue Cross Blue Shield, and it's covered mm -hmm. under Medicaid Medi Part, Part D, D because Medicare. they're over 65. Yeah, mm -hmm. which I think mm -hmm. is the recommended age is over 65. It's over 60. 60. Oh, it's yeah. 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have yeah. a gap of five mm -hmm. years that maybe they won't be covered. So it's just logistics at this point, but we do want to have it. But, do, but did ACIP actually recommend the vaccine or not? I thought they did. Too. Yeah. I mean, because there, there are lots of vaccines that come out. It's like, okay, this is nice, but really, what's the instance? Is this is sort of expensive. Was... All like the kids, yes. Sort of well, we'll see yeah. with, when it's official. I mean, I thought I had read something from some infectious disease folks that were that it was. That it was... I mean, if, if they are recommending it, that's, I mean, that's but I would fine. need to double check. That's what I thought. But there have been a lot of drugs that come down the pike that are very expensive that have been developed. That yeah. it's like, yeah, that's nice. It's great that you have it, but you know, something not everybody should get that. Yeah. And I don't know if it's over 60 and with certain conditions. Or... It is with certain conditions yeah. like diabetes. Uh, they, they had a whole the COPD was another one of them. But yeah. But the other good thing is when we met with GSK, they said they have like a, what's it called, like a patient payment help or something like if they ever get in trouble to get a bill that they can help them out or something like that yeah it just again it's another logistic thing where we have a third party that bills for us so then they would get a bill they would have to come back to us and we'd have to call and work out the whole process so 
we hope to have it. It's just a matter of making sure we got our ducks in a row so we can help people if they can't afford it. Just trying to look up if it's actually it's I know it's approved. Is it rec who's it recommended for officially is the question. But anyway, okay. So uh Ginny, why don't you continue on with any other I'll just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um the big question for August was immunization, especially for kids. So I think we're in like a little campaign to say make sure your kids are updated. We've been in touch with Susanna, um one of uh, the head school nurse and I Tiffany and I basically were just like, if you have somebody that needs shots, they don't have insurance, I can get them from you know, feeds and just immunize them then. So I've done that before already. So we do have like a protocol in place for that. Um, then we did have two CPR classes in July and August that were all attended. Uh, Hannah's already started um, getting into stuff from our balance programs, at least two of them. She plans on doing one virtually to see if there's a good response with that one. Um, and then one in person, I think she wants to do them at the cab. I'm not 100% sure. Um, we also, Hannah also had a feedback conversation at the Maine Housing Authority that had a lot of positive feedback. Um, she also helped with um, uh, the backpack drive, and she was able to donate 25 backpacks through um, feedback for reach. Um, we're already planning food clinics, we have to set up. Um, for September 16th, um, October 7th, Harvest Fair, and then we have two scheduled for Needham Housing Authority at both locations for now. And then we hope to have the COVID shot in tension on one side because we do, we've gotten a lot of interest in that as well. Um, I also forgot that I did this. The Needham channel <laughs> interviewed me about the sensory dispensers, completely forgot about that. Um, that was okay. a <laughs> That's why I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and then we um, licensed 11 temple teachers. And any. I've got the RSV stuff. Oh, you do? I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I did that now. Sure. Okay. All right. So, clinical guidance, this is from MMWR. Um, so, this is the official word from CDC from July of this year uh, for adults over age 60, over age 60. 60, unlike routine and risk-based vaccine recommendations, recommendations based on shared clinical decision-making, which is what this is, do not target all patients in a particular age group or an identifiable risk group. For RSV vaccination, the decision to vaccinate a patient should be based on a discussion between the healthcare provider and the patient, which may be guided by the patient's risk for disease and their characteristics, values, and preferences, the provider's clinical discretion, and the characteristics of the vaccine. Part of this discussion, consider you know risk for severe associated disease. So you know their highest risk um, would be chronic lung diseases, um, cardiovascular diseases, moderate or severe immunocompromised, diabetes, neurological, neuromuscular, kidney, liver, hematologic patients who are frail, advanced age, other underlying conditions or factors that the provider determines might increase the risk for severe RSV uh, related illnesses. Box for that. Uh, nursing home residents and other long-term care facility residents are also at, at high risk. So it's so yeah. it's it's not a blanket. Yeah, yeah you should be doing this for everybody. Yeah. it's uh, you know let it's let's talk about it. You yeah. know, and maybe it's right for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we did that with there was another something or other about the oh those who with COVID who could potentially get a specific another uh, dose because of their health concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, we always said make sure you discuss that with your provider. We don't do any checkup on that. We just say, if you had a conversation with your provider, then great, mm -hmm. we can provide that for you. Uh, and which I imagine about sequencing too. At least some folks were saying, maybe don't get them together because it hasn't been looked at yet in conjunction with the COVID vaccine. So like space them out a couple of weeks was what some folks were saying, as opposed to flu and COVID, they're yeah. fine together. Yeah, um, yeah co-administration of RSV vaccines without adult vaccines during the same visit is acceptable. You know, uh, available data on immunogenicity of co-administration <laughs> is currently limited. Co-administration with seasonal influenza vaccine met non-inferiority criteria. Boy, that's a low bar yeah. uh, for immunogenicity, with the exception of the flu A Darwin H3N2 strain when the GSK RSV vaccine was co-administered with uh, quadrivalent inactivated um, flu vaccine. So the uh, 
the it's inactivated, not inactivated. inactivated flu is, is the uh, is the is the nasal right? I think that's the only inactivated. Right? No, that's why yeah, it's yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's why it's anyway. No, inactivated yeah. is what everybody's getting. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's the major one that everybody's actually getting. But I did I feel like there was an interview and I was on the news with some of the ID folks who were like, we just don't have enough data to say for sure it's fine. So probably better to give yeah. it a few weeks in between. That could be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, Pfizer makes their R3 vaccine too, just in terms of another vendor. Um, yeah, he was like, I know there are other people. I can't tell you yeah. that there are other people. Yeah. 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 Okay. He was real nice about it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, so it's Sorry. not for everyone necessarily. Given that price point, that's a good thing. But yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah. just the one vendor. We don't know what Pfizer's yeah. price are. But clearly, some folks who can benefit. Okay. Anything else? Oh, Jenny, um, what was your ultimate uh, inclusion about the sunscreen dispensers at the end of the summer? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry, we just took the sunscreen out of the pool and it was pretty much all used up. Um, we have not checked the Fazio or Greens because um, it's hot. It's it's hot. It's it's out, yeah. So, we're probably going to look into October of what we agreed on to no, check and take them out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they were not nearly, the pools was nearly empty, but the other ones, we checked them throughout the summer yeah. and they were not used nearly as much. Mm-hmm. I think the location at Greens is, is not quite. I know. Like, like, closer to the, the gate, summer, maybe versus, where you enter. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of the fall mm-hmm. sports, maybe it will, you might actually end up yeah. getting yeah. Yeah. more yeah. in the fall. Yeah. yeah. For the yeah. We yeah. certainly received, I think there's been some feedback that the sunscreen is a little. Thick. 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 Yeah. Thick. I tried it at Green's and they're like, there's no solution to that. It was either the chemical or the mineral yeah. sunscreen. Yeah. And yeah. more than minimal sunscreen is creamy. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think that unfortunately, if it's not a popular yeah, choice. Yeah. Um, and the reason not to do the chemicals is because people don't like chemicals, but it's like one time a week. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. spo- you're like, well, it's a backup. Well, not only that, but it degrades, particularly in the heat and in the sun. So yeah. if you leave the dispensers outside, the chemical may degrade yeah. oh, quickly okay. as opposed one. to the mineral. The mineral will not degrade. Yeah. 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 If nobody uses it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe next year. people use it. Island, it. Like island, island. Yeah. 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 Try somewhere yeah. Try yeah. Some yeah. Different the pool is empty. Yeah. In terms of timing, um, it just makes sense, obviously, to look at the sun exposure, right? So it might just be, you know, equinox, equinox. Yeah. 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 I mean, that might be what you decide, or because people are more out the fall, you know, you know, yes, we go October first or what have you. Right. This is when we're gonna you know, call it quits for that. So, yeah. yeah. The other thing is too, if we got the chemical sunscreen, we would need a whole different dispenser for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I ended up popping that anyways. Mm-hmm. And it was like not used to, that was the one that had a step down, it was like this long metal one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it was Which because it was in more protected. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, it's back up for people. It's a nice service. Yes. I yeah. think I, if, you're, if you have nothing because you forgot, yeah, then you use what's there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If we have money, we can offer both. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the work. Okay. All right. Uh, substance use prevention. Yes. Um, so I think I probably mentioned at our last meeting that. Our three session strategic planning process for Mass Call 3 is complete. We finished in the end of June, and now we're working on finalizing our plan. And we will we'd be happy to send the PowerPoints from those sessions with you. They feature a lot of the data we collected and insight into the strategic planning process. But um, what was determined in those meetings from our 30 participants is that our strategic plan will focus on cannabis or marijuana and alcohol, specifically access and low perception of risk and harm. And we're now finalizing um, strategies based on feedback from the meetings, but we can share a couple of the strategies that we know we'll be moving forward with based on feedback from the meetings, the participants and from our data collected. Um, We have created a youth engagement, a youth engagement intern job posting with Tiffany's support and it's now posted. So Carol and I will be reviewing resumes and interviewing. Um, the primary role of the intern will be to build youth engagement in each town. 
starting with a photo voice project. Um, and we are also working towards implementing an evidence-based curriculum to impact the low perception of risk and harm of cannabis and alcohol in all four towns. So this would involve identifying what each town's public, middle, and high schools are already providing um, for curriculum and then advocating for a review and consideration of an evidence-based curriculum with information on brain development and mental health. We know kind of through our work and speaking with others that maybe some schools have information on alcohol, but not as much on cannabis. And we just want evidence-based, evidence-formed cur curriculum. Um, and would that tie into the salsa work that's already going on in the meeting? Um, schools, or? We, we will have to come up with something that hopefully would be uniform across our four towns. And then we can work with the different coalitions or different health department initiatives in each town to implement them. So hopefully if they're similar, that would make it easier for us and yeah. to work together. Um, we've also been attending the Needham Homelessness Task Force Coalition meetings facilitated by Jessica Moss, um, Jessica Moss, sorry, at CAF. And um, we particularly, Carol, continues to promote um, some of the behavioral health initiatives um, across the state and across our cluster, sharing that information with people who come to us for resources. And we've been working on kind of compiling information related to access to alcohol for youth, just to be prepared to talk about our work with people who ask us about it. Um, the foundation for this data that we've been using is Dr. David Jernigan from BU School of Public Health, his alcohol report that we shared in April. Um, it has a lot of Massachusetts specific data. So we're just becoming more familiar with certain data points that we can share. And um, last month we started working on putting together some background and research related to individual single use, um, single serving alcohol bottles or like NIPs. And we are kind of compiling that data with the other alcohol data. We have some basic information to share. Anyone's interested in that? Do you have anything to add? Oh, actually, Carol, sorry, before you add, I did want to update our cinema campaign that we've been talking about. It ended um, July 2nd, so I think we didn't have the final data to share at our last meeting, but we got um, information on final admissions to the movies that were showing the ad, and the final admissions number was 243,200 tickets sold to those movies. So we don't know exactly how many of those people actually watched the ad, but it's pretty good numbers. <laughs> and um, as of July, we also heard from our social media agency that we're working with that our social media ads on Instagram and Facebook had a total of 520,000 impressions, which is total times that the ads were viewed, and a reach, so individual accounts, um, 101,500 unique accounts saw the ads. And we don't, we just don't have more up-to-date information because our representative is on her honeymoon in the <laughs> wedding, so we'll have some more information to share later. Uh, uh, then let's move to substance use prevention. Oh, that's me because uh, of Karen. <laughs> so Karen had some talking points. Uh, span strategic planning sessions were completed her fourth session in August. Um, they were working with Amanda Decker of Bright Solutions. So the new strategic plan for span will be shared at a quarterly meeting on October 12th. Um, July and August saw various digital communications for community, capacity building with key stakeholders, presentation with salsa students at the Needham High School coaches meeting, and assistance with the Needham Overdose uh, Day vigil, which was held on August 31st. Um, with the stock grant, there were continues on alcohol compliance, including the planning for the next in-person tips training on October 16th. And salsa received a 10,000 grant from Metro West Health Foundation to establish a new salsa club at Pollard Middle School. Um, three Needham High School students, uh, salsa leaders recruited and hired 
an advisor and plans are underway for the new book. Okay, um, environmental health, sorry, and Tara, you want to start? Um, sure, so I guess we have two different reports for July and August. Um, let's see, so I guess Talia has switched roles from our, our um, I guess our division to uh, carries the shared services, um, so she's part of that team now. Um, and then Diana has kind of, uh, and this the chart basis on this last month, but she had switched roles to the state. Um, I was able to attend a conference in New, New Orleans, um, an EHA conference. It was great. Um, it will meet a lot of different people from Massachusetts and other states. Um, and amazing to see how, um, I guess, things are different in each of the states and how much they're kind of, how much like bigger scale work they're able to perform, I guess. Um, it's good to see that and get that experience. Um, and then in terms of outreach, Ecom and Madison in July were able to um, do um, some outreach in Cable, in cable and then um, and that has been great. Um, let's see what else. So that's July. Um, so for August, um, so both Econ and Madison um, have moved on to um, other roles, I guess. Madison didn't finish up her um, MPH program at UMass, and then Econ found a full-time job. Um, and then something that's coming up in October is our Food Safety Excellence Program on uh, food warm training. Um, I've um, already reached out to uh, all the food establishments that are, um, I guess, preparing food and got feedback ready from 70 individuals who have already signed up in the past week. So hoping it gets it will kind of grow in size. The feedback I've gotten is that most of the food establishments don't know when they're actually available. So like, I think I'll get probably a lot of last minute responses um, closer to um, the end of the month. So hopefully it's more in the hundreds and we get a lot of um, people showing up to that. Uh, so anything else? Um, I kind of did a lot of work, which is outlined in like the, the actual report. Any, any questions about like any of the, that work? I'm free to like expound on that if you want to, but yeah, Tara, anything else? Yeah. So, I mean, just as a feedback onto the staffing update. So, we did go out to repost uh, the lead's job and we had a couple good applicants, and our interview team did pick um, Pamela Ross Kung as our part time um, health inspector. And she has accepted the offer and is due to start on September 28th, that Monday. So we are thrilled to have her join our team. Um, she actually is one of the only state uh, FDA trained um, people that, that she worked with us on standard nine and mentored us on, on standardization and adopting our standards. So it's a huge asset to our team. And the fact that she reached out to Needham to inquire and ask if we had any positions available and it was a good timing type of thing, you know, we said, I'm sure we'll find something. You know? <laughs> yeah. So that worked out. Um, so that is happening. And then we also, um, have a couple of other updates to share. We did, uh, so Madison, as part of her summer intern um, program through the state, was able to assist us in our adoption of FDA standards six and seven. As you recall, standard six is the food food policy revised and standard seven is our um, stakeholder engagement initiative with the food, uh, food advisory board committee. So we finalized those had those audited. She came back to do a couple more tweaks and, and we had those um, accepted in August. So those were great. And she was able to put that on her um, accomplishments for the summer, which is terrific. And she's, uh, she was also integral, as you saw with Ecom and helping us um, get brochures developed for these pending uh, food code excellence, you know, initiatives and the trainings that are gonna be happening coming up. So we're really gearing up for that. Um, as you know, it'll be enacted on November 1st, right after our trainings have been completed. Uh, we're going to be getting the pilot program started, as you know, getting the feedback uh, from our 30 participating uh, restaurants, random restaurants that we're going to be uh, getting feedback from. So that, yeah, that's taken off. So we're going to be looking forward to having those this fall. Um, so I think those are the main things we had. We also have Nutritionally Needham in the wings. OECOM started that 
initiative and then now he's left so now it's all me <laughs> <laughs> trying to get all the menus finalized which i'm working with julie on and she's been a great help on helping us get all that on the website and the men and so this is we have like 16 restaurants right now and not just restaurants but also bid needham the schools you know public school the cafeterias uh, the calf is looking to do it. So just promotion mm -hmm. of healthy eating throughout mm -hmm. the month of October. Mm -hmm. So that will be something we're going to be racing to get out uh, and advertise as well. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Can we do something about the snacks in the kitchen? Our kitchen. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. Help your options. Two questions. One is... Okay. Uh, you know, pest activity in the Chapel Street lot because uh, we've had problems elsewhere yes, in that area. Yes, actually yesterday. Uh, <laughs> so I was out there yesterday. So, you yeah. know, have they just moved and what's the mitigation strategy? Here? So do you want to give an update on what you did yesterday on that site visit? Eddie? Oh, yeah. So I guess there's definitely activity, I think, along just the train tracks in general. Mm -hmm. um, it might be more expansive than we actually think, and we're seeing it in certain areas, but I guess Chapel Street's a hot spot. Um, in front of Anton's yesterday, I was able to see the first boroughs there as well, um, and we're working with Anton's about that. I think uh, I haven't heard back from the manager, but I was only there yesterday, and I talked to um, French Press as well about that, because they're the ones who saw it. The boroughs in the first place so mm -hmm. there's an individual who's um spreading bird seed mm -hmm. and the parking lot over there so to find that person and kind of just let them know not to do that anymore so right <laughs> this could be one of our sources of yeah that's right. just one yeah. Yeah. the food source is right. the problem and, and we had that this yeah on what's what's heard on back behind where the tortilla chip place was yeah. had somebody feeding birds on there so yeah. 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 was um Rice yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he's kind of so he's hired an electrician and a plumber, but um, I met with him last week, and um, um, the work has ceased with the electrician because the scope of work was too too much for what he actually paid for. So it kind of the, mm -hmm. the it's kind of um, halted right now. So he's mm -hmm. kind of. Um, he, he, he like came to me for advice and I said I couldn't like, advise him on, on anything. He had to like maybe find another electrician or like continue with the work kind of thing. So mm -hmm. he's kind of like stalled at the moment mm -hmm. again. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. Yeah, so we'll, we'll wait and see. Again, the plumber has started <clears throat> as well because that was another thing. Oh, it's it's well. just seems like a health issue, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just, so we'll wait and see. Again, uh, it, it sounds like his landlord may have extended the lease because I thought the lease was at the end of August, correct? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That will keep updated. Okay, and then last, the shared services. Thanks. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm Carrie Janelle. I am the new manager for the Shared Services Program and the Regional Training Hub. And I wanted to use our time today to introduce myself and introduce my colleague, Samantha Menard, who is um, there virtually with us, and then see if y'all had any questions about it. Um, I've worked in public health for um, a little more than 20 years. Um, I, um, I And I think the things that I bring to this position, the reason that I really, um, that it fit well and I wanted to do this. Um, one of the first projects I did was for a um, national grant from the um, from NATO. I was part of uh, Advanced Practice Center staff um, led by my colleague. I mean, um, actually, and my charge was to get a intermunicipal agreement developed for public health neutrality among 27 communities, and we did manage to accomplish that um, and had it signed by 28, actually, got Boston to join us. Um, so, and that's kind of how I fell in love with public health by going around to all the different communities. And then since then, I also worked on a um, uh, we did the revamp for the emergency expensing sites. Um, we did a lot of work um, understanding what local public health needs are. I then moved and did management for a national demonstration grant that the EU had about emergency communication um, that kind of morphed and then led into what um, you may know of as healthcare code. Health and medical coordinating coalitions, which are the emergency preparedness body. Um, did a lot of work with DPH for that, as well as with local communities. Um, then 
um, was part of the, pra the BU practice office restructuring. So I, I was employed by the BU School of Public Health for 11 years and did a lot of that work under the, their auspices. Um, so working with uh, practicum places for students, working with faculty, working with students and kind of understanding all of their needs and figuring out how to um, introduce them to the broad range students, introduce them to the broad range of public health issues and then help them find practicums to meet their needs. I also was the manager for the local public health Inst training institute, LPHI, um, which is the source for the online trainings that y'all may be familiar with. I uh, managed and worked with SMEs to develop the number of the courses and then also was kind of the traffic manager for the uh, technical development working with our instructional designers and um, front end developers that make those available. Um, I left that to then go to, so the last two years I've been um, running one of the healthcare, health and medical coordinating coalitions, which Needham is part of, so the Metro Region Preparedness Coalition. Um, I, um, and that's Needham, so it's uh, 60 communities, 12 hospitals, seven MRCs. So I'm, I'm pretty well baked into kind of what the public health environment is. I have a pretty good understanding and I have um, relationships and the ability to reach out to folks to get questions clarified. Um, so um, for our current work, we've been busy. Um, I was supposed to get an intermunicipal agreement done among the four communities by December 31st. I've already talked to Diana, who is now a TPH and, and part of our points of contact. And, and she agreed that that's a some communities may be, some groups may be ready to do that. Um, we are not necessarily, they understand that um, with all of the shared service arrangements across the state, there's gonna be different barriers. So we'll be starting to work with that. Um, Sam and I have been working with Relevant Technology, which is the um, vendor for the uh, inspection reporting um, documents, well, not the documents, app. Um, and, um, all of the communities now have a signed contract with that, so that's great. So that and Sam will talk a little bit more about our, our plans with that. We've been um, doing some high, well, initiating some hiring. There is um, there are a couple of positions we uh, received applications for a public health nurse um, that she would be placed mostly in Dover, but also uh, working with Sherborne. Uh, there seem to be some. It seems to be we need to do a little bit of more work with Dover and Sherborne uh, to understand what the agreements were. We've got some, um, uh, call it a telephone game, uh, a, little bit, um, a little bit of cleanup to do to make sure we're clear on that. Um, but we did post that and have some um, have some applicants and um, was able to draw on the folks here at the department to get to know you initially. Um, and we also posted for a uh, trainer that would work with Sam that would be supporting the communities in our training hub. Um, the applicant pool for that was not as strong. We really need someone who has training experience. So um, had some conversations just yesterday with DPH about different strategies. Could we um, hire someone with a lot of experience ready to ship to doing training and train them up using Sam's great experience? Um, do we delay, do we, you know, change the position and, you know, do we change the scope of the position? You know, we're, we're trying to see what we can do to adjust with that. Um, and I guess the only other thing I'll say is before I, so I'll say two things. I am a member of the, of a three person appointed board of health in my home community of getting me a reading for the home rule legislation to make us five so that we can talk to each other. So I, <laughs> I recognize a lot of what y'all are talking about. And I want to introduce Sam Menard, who is my, the assistant manager and also the lead trainer. And I'm so lucky, we are so lucky to have Sam. She's a really talented person who came to us from Brookline. And she has a depth of experience in environmental health that I don't have that. So we, we make a nice pairing. And Sam, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of talk about what you, we've been up to, you've been up to? 
Sure. Thanks, Carrie. Very excited to meet you all. Um, like Carrie said, I uh, came here from the Brookline Health Department. I was there for the past four years as a senior public health inspector. And before that, I was at the Newton Health Department. Just really excited to be a part of the team here. Happy to answer any questions. Carrie and I have been hard at work um, already um, in terms of relevant. We've had a ton of meetings with them thus far. We're getting caught up on the software, hoping to get that implemented throughout the four communities as soon as possible. We have all the iPads ready to uh, be gifted out to the communities. We're just waiting on a few last signatures um, and that's been started. Um, been really great getting to know the team here, working with Tara and Sai. They've been amazing um, and really just excited to get out there in the other communities um, and start uh, spreading the wealth of our services. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, Tiffany, there's one last thing on your other items, need a public health strategic plan. Yeah, I think Lynn touched on most of it. Um, the only other thing I might add is that we're almost complete with the vision and the mission. Um, so I think that would be part of the conversation of, that you guys will have with that process as well. Um, we're probably about halfway through and we'll start key informant interviews. Soon, with not just you guys, community members, other groups, people that we hopefully will help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's it. Any other business? I think we, I think Rob had to jump off, but uh, we want the motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. Second. Second. Sorry. Okay, so Kathleen. Uh, yes. Uh, Ed. Yes. Stephen. Yes. Pedro. Yes. And so we're doing it. And the next meeting is October 13th. 13th. Yep. Do you know where that one is? Yeah. I'm assuming here. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, I really don't.